from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome, everybody, to another uh, Thursday at 3. Um, to many of you are familiar faces now, some of you are new. Uh, today, it's a great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, Chet Van Duzer back to our division. He's a, a familiar fellow to many of us here in the library. We were trying to remember when he first started showing up in the reading room. I think it was around 2010. Um, 2011, he was the um, Kislak fellow in, in the um, uh, the Kluge Center uh, doing work on maps and uh, the benefit of course for those of us who are in reading rooms and reference stations when Chet is around is a simple query for a book turns into a small workshop from Chet <laughs> so we've learned a great deal and he's a, uh, not only a great scholar but also a natural teacher and, and uh, many of us appreciate that opportunity um, so over the years we've managed to become equally expert in the books that he's written uh, uh, global um, Floating Islands, a global bibliography, a book on Schoener's 1515 Globe, uh, a, a lovely book on the 1507 and 1516 uh, uh, Valtimuller map, and uh, just a few years ago we heard a talk from him about uh, sea monsters in medieval and renaissance maps, uh, a book that many of us have on our shelves actually at the moment. So uh, today he's talking about uh, some of his recent work. Chet's work has always seemed to me to be involved around what maps tell us in terms of understanding the perception of the world that surrounds people, both the known and the unknown world. And oftentimes, in a very kind of humane way, he's looking at maps to understand people's perceptions of the world. And my uh, notion of his talk today, which is about looking at several uh, copies of Ptolemy's geography, although I don't know what was wrong with just looking at ours, um, <laughs> um, has led him to some conclusions and again is arriving at some kind of impression of what these uh, contributors, these annotators to the uh, geography have to tell us about the perception of their world, uh, both known and unknown. So we're really thrilled to have you back and to give a talk. So please welcome Chet Van Duzer. Thank you, Mark, and thank you uh, all for coming. Uh, I don't think I need to say that uh, manuscript annotations, notes made by uh, the readers and users of early modern books are wonderful evidence as to how those works were received and used. So I'll be looking today at the annotations in four different copies of Ptolemy's geography, two here at the Library of Congress and two in <coughs> other institutions. <laughs> Um, so I'll begin by a few words about what Ptolemy's geography is. Uh, it was written in the second century AD in Alexandria, Egypt, which was then culturally Greek. Um, it consists of two principal parts, uh, instructions on how to make maps, and a database of about 8,000 place names with their latitudes and longitudes, so the information needed to fill the maps. Um, we don't necessarily see a Ptolemaic map every day, so here's a Ptolemaic world map uh, manuscript. And just to orient ourselves a little bit, here is Europe, Africa, and Asia. So when uh, Ptolemy's geography was rediscovered in Byzantium in about 1300, and then diffused uh, from Byzantium to Italy, um, and then reproduced in a profusion of manuscripts and printed editions, it was realized that Ptolemy's data was, uh, at that point, more than a thousand years old. And so, uh, well, on the one hand, there was this great respect for Ptolemy and his geography, but on the other hand, there was this uh, series of various different attempts to supplement or update or correct Ptolemy. And um, just to to look at one uh, example of that, a, a visual example. So on this Ptolemaic world map, uh, the northern edge of the map is what the edge of a map should be. It's, it's the limit of knowledge. Um, but there are other Ptolemaic world maps where that is not the case. Here the geography spills over the northern border. 
So this is one visual example of the way in which uh, cartographers and editors of the work sought to update and supplement Ptolemy's geography. And I'd like to consider the annotations as another way in which readers and users of the book supplemented uh, Ptolemy's geography. In particular, uh, as I said, Ptolemy's geography is mostly this huge database of 8,000 place names with their latitudes and longitudes. He offers very little in the way of description. And a lot of readers uh, felt that want. They wanted more in the way of description. And uh, one, in studying the annotations in Ptolemy's geography, one gets the sense that a desire for more descriptive information about the world was an important motivating factor in the, uh, the, the placement, the writing of annotations in the book. So these are the four copies I'll look at. Uh, one at the Lilly Library, two here at the Library of Congress, and uh, the last one at Princeton. So beginning with the Lilly Library copy, I begin not with the Lilly Library copy, but with a, uh, a, a, the map of the British Isles from uh, the 1513 edition, which is the same edition that, that, that that's at the Lilly Library, but without any annotations, without any hand coloring, and without any other graphic additions, which we'll see in a moment. Switching now to the same map in the Lilly Library copy, we can see that, first of all, it's hand colored. That's not so unusual. There are also the addition of two ships, which is unusual in the uh, sort of supplementary decoration of Ptolemaic maps, and a fairly extensive program of annotation. And I'll look at this one annotation, which is just north of Ireland. Here it is. I've transcribed the text below. And the annotator is talking about the conversion of the British Isles to Christianity. And you'll notice at the end, he specifies the latitude and longitude of uh, the middle of this region. And then at the very end, he says Segundum Sconer. Uh, so very helpfully indicating his source that isn't often the case with annotations. By Sconer, he means Johann Schoener, uh, who was the creator of this uh, printed globe of 1515. He also made a manuscript globe in 1520, which is in the National, uh, German National Museum in Nuremberg. To accompany his globe, uh, Schoener printed this pamphlet, which uh, in an interesting way is, is similar to the annotations that occur in copies of Ptolemy's geography. It's supplementary information, descriptive information that he did not have room for on the globe. And it turns out that the annotator in the Lilly Library, Ptolemy, was cribbing, was copying his information from this pamphlet. So he found a source that offered precisely the supplementary descriptive information he wanted and copied that information into this copy of Ptolemy, making it uh, a, a more complete uh, reference work, if you will, to the world. So here's the passage in question. Uh, I've transcribed the two. The, the wording is not identical, but it's very similar. Um, in particular, at the very end, uh, skipping over the Latin, you can see that the coordinates uh, indicated are the same. Uh, 7 degrees 30 and 57 degrees. To look at another example, this is the third map of Africa in the 1513 Ptolemy at the Lilly Library. Uh, the annotations are faint, but there are four of them on this map, and I'll, I'll focus on this one here at the bottom. Uh, here is the transcription. <clears throat> uh, he's talking about the location of uh, two peoples in Africa with respect to the Red Sea and the fact that the, the people called fish eaters eat fish. Um, one helpful thing about identifying the source that an annotator was using is that it can be helpful in, in this case, uh, filling in for information that's been cropped. Uh, so the book was rebound at some point, information was cropped, and I was able to supply missing words because I knew the source that the annotator was using. So here's the passage in uh, Schoner's pamphlet. And here is a comparison between the two texts. <clears throat> uh, an interesting feature here is that the coordinates are not the same. 
And I think what's happened is that Schoener was supplying the coordinates of the center of the whole region, and the annotator is supplying the coordinates of the center of the area where those two people live. That's my best guess. Um, so in that case, uh, the scheme of annotation is, is pretty simple to understand. The annotator found a reference work that contained supplementary descriptive information that was to his liking. He copied some of that information into the book. Um, let's look now at the 1513 Ptolemy in the Thatcher Collection here at the Library of Congress. Here's the title page. In this case, a, a later user has scratched out the name of an earlier owner. owner. <clears throat> uh, here is uh, Book 2, Chapters 10 to 11 in that copy. Um, there's an extensive program of indicating the modern equivalents of classical place names. Uh, and there is also um, the addition of descriptive texts, uh, such as the one I've highlighted here. And it is at the very beginning of chapter 11 of book two of the geography. So zooming in, here we have the text. Uh, I transcribe it on the right. He's talking about the name of Germany and the names of the different peoples that live in Germany. The source of these annotations is the 1535 edition of Ptolemy's geography. <clears throat> so the, the desire for additional descriptive information in Ptolemy's geography was not confined to manuscript annotations. Uh, people editing the work and making printed editions of it also added supplementary descriptive information. The 1535 edition has supplementary material by Michael Servetus, the Spanish polymath. <clears throat> so if we look at the corresponding passage in the 1535 edition, that is book two, chapters 10 to 11, Again, right at the beginning of chapter 11, we have supplementary marginal inf information that's been added by Servetus. That is, it's not information that comes from Ptolemy. And it's precisely the same information. Uh, he's talking about the name Germany and the names of the peoples that live in Germany. Um, to look at another example, uh, the beginning of book seven, chapter one, in again, the 1511 copy here at the Library of Congress. Here is the annotation. Uh, he's talking about the river Ganges. And once again, he's taken this information from the 1535 Ptolemy. Again, right at the beginning of Book 7, Chapter 1 in the 1535 edition, we have this printed um, marginal information, <coughs> which is also about the River Ganges. It's almost exactly the same word for word as <clears throat> the annotation in the 1511 uh, copy of the, the geography here at the library. So once again, we've had the annotator has found a printed book that contains exactly the type of descriptive information he was interested in, and he's added that information to the book by hand. <clears throat> Moving on to another case, this is the 1486 Ptolemy here at the Library of Congress and also in the Thatcher Collection. Here is the opening of the book, <clears throat> so it's hand colored. And here is the 10th map of Greece, 10th um, map of Europe, which is of Greece. And we can see a, a fairly extensive program of annotation not so different from what we've seen before, but in fact, the program in this book is much more extensive, as we can see here. <clears throat> so very extensive notes added at the bottom of both pages, these being the pages following the fourth map of Africa. And following some maps, is the, the entire page is filled with supplementary descriptive information. <clears throat> so to look at one example, uh, here we have the first map of Europe, which is of the British Isles. And zooming in on the annotation and translating, in the year 180 after the birth of Christ, the king of Britain, lame, named Lucius, converted to Christianity. The island was later called Anglia because it was conquered by the Anglos, although at the time there were already Christians in Spain and France, but not all of Spain or France was Christian. 
like England, which was called a holy Christian country, and the Flamines, the priests of the Roman religion, converted to bishops, and the Archflamines into archbishops. This is when Eleuterus was pope in Rome, and Commodus Antonius, son of Marcus Aurelius, was emperor. <clears throat> so a type of information very different from a catalog of place names with their latitudes and longitudes. More detailed descriptive historical information. <clears throat> and in particular here, relating to Christian history and the spread of Christianity in Europe. So this particular book has a very extensive program of annotation. And I'll just indicate some of the annotator's favorite subjects. So Christian history, unsurprisingly. Alexander the Great, many of the annotations relate to Alexander the Great <clears throat> as, a, as a mythological figure. The Seven Wonders of the World, information about the wonders is spread throughout the annotations. And Spices, there's a, a pretty substantial discourse on the spices of Asia. <clears throat> so looking at one other specific annotation in this book, um, this is a page following the third map of Africa and reading the text at the top, Pindar the Theban, who flourished during the first Olympiad, said that water exceeds the other elements just as gold exceeds the other metals, because you can barely remove something without the help of water, as it is known by the various virtues it has in different parts of the world. Athenaeus says that the waters of the Nile are extremely fertile, and Pliny, Galen, and Seneca say that women even come to bear children every seven years by virtue of the waters of the Nile, which make them fertile. For which reason, the poet Parmenon calls the Nile the god of Egypt, which is well known from Juan de Pineda in his book on Christian agriculture. So here again, the annotator is very uh, conveniently indicating one of his sources, <clears throat> which is this book, uh, Juan de Pineda's Agricultura Cristiana, which was published in Salamanca in 1589. So and what that tells us is that the annotations were made about 100 years after the book was printed. They were also made in Spanish rather than Latin, which is unusual. But I think the fact that they were made 100 years after the book was published is really impressive. It's a real testament to the continuing interest <clears throat> in Ptolemy's geography, even as, for example, other cartographic material became available, such as uh, Ab Abraham Ortelius's Theatrum Orbis Terrarum, the first um, atlas in the modern sense of the word, which was published, first published in 1570. It's also perhaps evidence uh, of the expense of a copy of Ptolemy's geography, um, given that it was seen uh, to make more sense to add material to a copy that was 100, 100 years old rather than buying a new one. Um, another page of annotation in the same book. It has extensive supplementary material about China and the Philippines, <clears throat> but interestingly, nothing about the New World uh, appears in the annotations in this copy. Moving now to the fourth example, which is the 1525 Ptolemy at Princeton. So here is the Ptolemaic map of Spain. You can see that there are annotations almost everywhere. It really is an extraordinary degree of annotation. And <clears throat> I think it's fair to say the annotations are of an extraordinarily high level of interest. Here's the Ptolemaic world map. Uh, we can see, I'll come back to this later, but this very careful uh, layout of the annotations on the page. <clears throat> and as in the, the Thatcher 1486 copy at the Library of Congress, we have extensive uh, supplementary material added to blank pages following the maps. Um, the, uh, the copy, again, was printed in 1525. The annotations were composed in 1527. At one point, the annota annotator speaks of an historical event in Hungary, which took place in 1526, as having taken place the previous summer. Uh, so it's, it's nice to be able to date the composition of the annotations. Um, we can see this difference, uh, visual difference, in the two halves of the book. So we have the, the text block uh, of Ptolemy's geography on the left, 
and the maps on the right. The maps are annotated, the text is not. And it, it was quite clear that a dealer at some point in the book's history put these two halves together in order to be able to sell a complete copy. I'll return to that question at the end of the talk. So the content of the annotations in the Princeton um, 1525 Ptolemy. So just to take a few examples, this is the third map of Africa. Again, we can see this very, very extensive program of annotation. <clears throat> I'll look at three spots, beginning with this one. The annotator says, add, and that's an instruction to a student, telling him to write in the book, <clears throat> add that the map above is defective. For there where I put this sign, which I've circled, uh, there is Aphrodite, Aphroditopolites, Nome, and a landlocked metropolis between which and Crocodilopolis, toward the Nile, there is, was Lake Midios, about which below. So he uses a sign to indicate where on the map this information applies to, and then he also indicates that he'll add more information about this lake below. <clears throat> so there is the sign he's added to the map in the relevant location, just above Crocodilopolis. And then continuing uh, with the text below, and this is quite long, add, again, an instruction to the student, write this. <clears throat> add beside Crocodilopolis the fact that its king built a labyrinth towards that city of Sanietum, in which there were 6,000 homes, and the pyramids along its sides were more worthy of admiration than the temple of Diana in Ephesus. Nor was Lake Mirias above which the labyrinth was located and which was created by men any less remarkable, being 3,600 stadia in circumference, stretching north and south and 50 paces deep. In the middle of it, there were two pyramids that rose 50 paces high out of the water and extended just as far into the depths, a pace of six feet or four cubits, while a foot is 16 fingers. So adding information about uh, units of measurement. The lake was filled by six months of diverting water from the Nile. And this is enough to show the useless vanity of the Egyptian kings. <laughs> so this annotator has quite a strong character. Uh, the 1525 edition already contains supplementary descriptive material. And he is very comfortable disagreeing with that material and saying that the person who composed that material was a fool. Um, <clears throat> And in a, in a general way, we can see he's adding a lot of historical and descriptive information here, exactly the sort of thing that is not found in Ptolemy. And uh, I, I think one of the other really outstanding features of this book is that the annotations were composed for a student. So this is a program of geographical education in the early 16th century. Look at another example, the fourth map of Asia. <clears throat> he, he writes, not far from Tripoli, there is a field that Strabo calls Macra, in which Posidonius says a dead dragon was seen. It covered half an acre and was so thick that men mounted on horses on either side could not see each other. Its mouth was large enough to receive a man riding a horse, and each scale of its skin was larger than its shield. So... Uh, <clears throat> we'll see that he, the annotator is interested in natural history information, geographical information, and ethnographical information. Another example from the Ptolemaic map of Greece. Here he's drawn in two islands that Ptolemy omitted and writes, Ptolemy omits this island which is famous for the grave of Homer. So a couple things here. Despite his great respect for Ptolemy, he's very content to disagree with him and correct him. And also his powerful interest in classical culture. <clears throat> so the vast majority of his annotations relate to classical culture and not so much to Christian history. Um, the map of the Atlantic and the New World, so that's South America at the lower left. Going back one page to the page preceding the map of the New World, he has a substantial annotation here that says, remark, as I often said, that neither this route to the west, that is, to the New World, nor that of the Portuguese around the tip of Africa is new, 
but had already been done by other ancients, then abandoned, and now finally in our times taken up again, as is clear from Aristotle, a most celebrated witness and a noble author for increasing one's confidence. So <clears throat> his, his respect for classical antiquity, antiquity was so strong that he believed that the, the new world had already been discovered in antiquity, and he's also referring to passages circumnavigating Africa that were made in antiquity. So the, voyage, the, more, the recent voyages and discoveries of the Spanish and Portuguese were in his mind worth very little. Looking uh, at the map of the New World, he writes here, along these same lines, we will venture, based on the ex excerpts from Aristotle that I transcribed below, that the men and women found in this new land were Carthaginians by or origin, and that afterwards, left alone and deprived of communication with other peoples, they became savages and gradually lost their customs and rights and the use of clothing through long doicitude. <clears throat> so he's referring to a passage in a pseudo-Aristotelian work um, that says that the Carthaginians discovered a, a very, very large island in the Atlantic with navigable rivers. And he believes that that's where the people of the New World came from. So this, it was this great intellectual question. If all people de descend from Adam and Eve and Columbus's was the first encounter with the New World, where do the people who are there come from? This is his answer to that question. He believes it was this Carthaginian voyage alluded to by uh, pseudo-Aristotle. <clears throat> so uh, moving on to some evidence of the annotator's, uh, shall we say, sharp character. Here we have the modern map of France. He's added this banner across the top, and he does this on a number of maps. <clears throat> and he says, this province produces a great number of chicken farmers, innkeepers, cooks, flute players, gamblers, drunkards, and fools. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so he, he has uh, his sharp opinions about a number of people. Uh, as I'll indicate later, he's Italian, but he has, he has unlimited scorn for Southern Italians. Uh, <laughs> uh, the modern map of Spain. Uh, here he says, the best thing for one's financial affairs is not to take a loan from a <laughs> Catalan merchant. <laughs> so, the, the book has, has quite a number of these, uh, of, of statements like this, these pretty outrageous statements. Um, and so, again, he, he's not afraid to make blanket uh, criticisms of whole nations. He's not afraid to disagree with Ptolemy. He's not afraid to disagree um, with uh, previous commentators on Ptolemy. So, uh, it's interesting to look at which maps are annotated and which maps are not, because they're not all annotated. And what it raises the question of whether this program was perhaps incomplete, whether he intended eventually to annotate all the maps and didn't have time. But nonetheless, some of them in their current state are not annotated. So here we have the Ptolemaic map of Taprobana in the Indian Ocean, which is usually identified with Sri Lanka. Um, he certainly, there was plenty of classical material he could have cited about uh, Taprobana. He did not. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I'm inclined to suspect that that's because his focus really was on the Mediterranean basin uh, and where uh, classical uh, civilization was most active. The modern map of the Holy Land. Uh, I'd, I think it's fair to say it's a little surprising that there's no annotation on this map. The modern map of southern Africa. Uh, I think a lot of other annotators might have eagerly written something on this map about the Portuguese voyages around uh, circumnavigating Africa. Since he believed that this had already been accomplished in antiquity, his, his lack of remark here I think is, is understandable. So looking at the sources of the annotations, uh, one of his favorite works uh, was this one, uh, Radiganus' uh, Antiquarum Lectionum, which <clears throat> is this huge collection of notes on mostly classical subjects, but uh, some modern themes as well. The, the sheer amount of information is encyclopedic. Uh, fortunately, there's an index, 
because without an index, it would be almost unnavigable. But it is a tremendously rich resource in terms of if one were somehow interested in acquiring information from classical sources without going to the sources themselves, uh, this is a wonderful work for that. The annotator does also cite classical sources directly. So I guess in this, uh, when he used this book, he was uh, saving time. Uh, this is a similar work uh, by Sabellico, the Rhapsodiae Historiarum in, in Ediarum, uh, first published in 1516. Again, a tremendous mass of material culled from classical sources. <coughs> uh, this is uh, Pomponius Mela's, uh, the Roman geographer's uh, study of the world, uh, with the commentary of Vadianus, uh, the Swiss humanist. And he makes very heavy use of Vadianus' commentary. And this book is uh, on display here. And uh, the title page of Giovanni's uh, Pontano Dialoghi, uh, a lot of the insults uh, that he makes of various uh, peoples come from this book. So he wasn't just using phrases he'd heard on the street. He's a humanist. He has a source for his insults. <laughs> and a few words about this, the care spent on the annotations. So here we have a detail of one of the annotations. <clears throat> Uh, if you've looked at annotated Ptolemies, one thing that's immediately striking is that it's legible. Uh, so a scribe was paid to write these annotations into this book. So immediately we're talking about, set aside all the time spent perusing these works to choose the information to put into the book. On top of that, we have the money spent on a scribe. So we're talking about a very elite circle here. Um, just for comparison's sake, here's the sort of handwriting you often see in an annotated Ptolemy. It's yeah, sort of scribbling. Um, here's the modern map of Eastern India. <clears throat> and the text following it, again, this profusion of information added to the book. And one of its interesting features is how carefully planned the whole program of annotations is. He often refers in one annotation to another one. So zooming in a bit, he says, in addition to what was said on the four other maps of India, I think it is worth adding a few words here regarding the fertility of that land. So he's always very conscious of what he's written elsewhere. The Ptolemaic map of the world, which I showed earlier, the, the layout here is really remarkable. So symmetrically, at the top and the bottom of the page, we have quotations from Vitruvius about the inhabitants of the northern and southern parts of the world. So symmetric quotations from the same author. Then we have these triangular texts. You know, and it didn't happen by accident that the text fits perfectly in those triangles. This whole thing had to have been tried out before. Uh, and he argues in these texts that the inhabited lands form, in effect, a large island surrounded by the ocean. So he has a title of the annotation at the left on the Hyperboreans, at the right on the Antipodes. <clears throat> and those texts go down the margins and then stretch in towards the gutter, and they stretch in towards the gutter exactly the same amount. So the whole layout of the annotations on this map was very carefully planned. The purpose of the annotations. So as I've said, these were annotations made for a student. In the third map of Africa, uh, looking in the lower left, <clears throat> where I added the Nasamones who were missing so, I, so that you would know the custom of this people. So you addressing the student, and we see here this interest in ethnography. And again, correcting Ptolemy, they were missing. Uh, here I am, I'm adding them. The Ptolemaic map of Greece, at the lower left, this I have willingly written so that you will know that these provinces have many products suited to the study of the inhabitants, that is, things that are revealing about the inhabitants. So again, a strong interest in ethnography. Uh, following the Ptolemaic map of France, 
anyone investigating the ancient customs of the French should be aware of that, and so on and so forth. So there's an expectation that one who's reading these annotations would be interested in knowing about the ancient customs of the French. The eighth map of Europe, about which also see book one of our Strabo, to whom you should have recourse for such things rather than to others. So advice to the student about which classical authors to consult on which subjects. Ptolemaic map of Asia, Asia Minor. <clears throat> I have explained these things from Alexander the Great here so that by using them you can understand what Pliny says in Book 5, Chapter 29. So this expectation that the student will be constantly engaged with classical authors. <clears throat> All of the Alpine peoples are listed by Pliny, but you, the student, list them with their modern names. Write the modern names beside the ancient ones by conjecture. So he's giving an exercise to the student. Write out the classical place names and try to figure out what the modern equivalents are. This is the, the, the clearest um, example, the clearest evidence that this was for a student, that this was part of an education. So how does this, uh, this program of geographical education compare with others that were available in the early 16th century? The short answer, it's far, far more sophisticated. Uh, it was in the early 16th century that, works, uh, that educational works in geography began to be published, really, and they're incredibly basic. So here's Peter Apian's Cosmographicus Liber of 1524, very close in time to the annotations in the Princeton Ptolemy. Asia is described in one page. Um, he probably has one annotation in Asia that's that long. Uh, a long list of place names with their latitudes and longitudes. So memorization. Um, so we're not getting a lot of the descriptive, ethnographic, rich detail that the annotator provides his student. Johannes Hunter's Rudimenta Cosmographica uh, first published in 1530. Uh, just to take a sentence at random, the most important cities of Poland are a list. No actual details given about any of them. Uh, list of classical names with modern equivalents. This at least is something similar to what he'd assigned his student, the annotator of the Princeton Ptolemy. Um, what can we conclude about the annotator? <clears throat> well, he was Italian. Uh, he uses Italian sources mostly, uh, not exclusively, but almost. He, there's an occasional Italian word that slips into his Latin. And the banner across uh, one map of Italy reads, heroic virtue is inherent in Italian blood. Um, and there's plenty of other evidence that he was Italian. Um, I do not know what city he's from. He never puts a circle around a city that is suggestive. Um, he does not say who he is. Um, it would be certainly gratifying to know who he was. Uh, <clears throat> it might be helpful in elucidating some aspects of the program of annotation. But overall, I find the content of the annotations more interesting than his identity. He tells us that he traveled widely. He visited the Hungarian court on commerce. Um, he visited Augsburg. He traveled to England. At one point, he lists the most important uh, English ecclesiastical writers. He may have visited the shrine of Thomas Becket. He has a description of it um, that is, uh, doesn't appear in any other source. Um, he also seems to have traveled to Greece. Some of the details he gives in his annotations um, about the maps of, on the maps of Greece seem detailed enough to have been written by someone who was there. And his primary interest was in European classical antiquity. The maps of Asia are very lightly annotated. Uh, the modern maps are very lightly annotated, which is a powerful piece of evidence. So he's really more interested in ancient geography. Uh, there was no annotation on the map of the Holy Land. He repeatedly argues against the great antiquity of Egypt. Um, and, and this is his way of asserting the far greater importance of Greece and Rome. 
And he, again, he argues that recent geographical discoveries merely repeated the accomplishments of the ancients. <clears throat> so a few conclusions. What is this book exactly? Um, so we know it was intended for an advanced student of geography. This is not for a beginner by any means. Um, the annotations prof profess an interest in ethnography and more broadly show the richness of classical geography. The hiring of a scribe and careful arrangement of the text indicate a luxury production. And so I, I think um, the most natural conclusion is that this was uh, a textbook, if you will, for a very elite student. So there was a lot of time and money uh, available for this project. And again, we're talking about a, a student more advanced than would have been served by the textbooks available at the time. It's also at least possible that this was a fair copy for the annotator himself. Hard to be certain. Um, so as I said before, uh, what Princeton has is really half the book. They have the annotated maps, which at some point were put together with the unannotated text from another copy. Um, <clears throat> by a remarkable stroke of good fortune, so here's that, that point in the Princeton copy where we have the, you can see the physical difference uh, between the pages. We have the beginning of the annotated maps on the right and the unannotated text on the left. By a remarkable stroke of good fortune, I was able to find in a private collection in Brussels uh, just the text, not the maps, annotated by the same hand. Uh, so there is, I mean, the handwriting is identical. Um, and again, so what Princeton has is just the annotated maps. What the collector has is just the annotated text. Um, the collector uh, realized that it didn't make any sense for the two halves to be apart, <clears throat> and that Princeton would never, ever, ever sell their half. <laughs> <laughs> so he very graciously has sold his half of the book to Princeton, and so now after, uh, well, quite some time apart, and uh, at least some time on different sides of the Atlantic, they're now reunited, which is very exciting. Thank you. I also to make an announcement that Chet has volunteered to find uh, any kind of missing material from our collection <laughs> and to bring it back to us, uh, preferably by donation, uh, if at all possible. Uh, it, but we do have time for some questions. And Chet, if you would describe what's on the table for yeah, sure. so we can see afterwards. Uh, so we have three Ptolemies here. We have the 1511 copy of the left, which has the annotations that were borrowed from the 1535 edition, which is just to its right. And I've indicated with arrows uh, in the copy on the left a manuscript annotation which comes from the printed text indicated with an arrow on the right. And then we have the 1486 uh, Thatcher Ptolemy here, which is, which is the one extensively annotated in Spanish. And he, here we have two of the most important sources used by the annotator of the Princeton copy. By good fortune, both of these copies are themselves annotated <laughs> and uh, await study. So, do, uh, questions for Chad? <clears throat> Thank you so much. This was just fascinating. Um, and um, I have a question about the, uh, I believe it was the Princeton version that you mentioned here um, with such a colorful annotator here who seems to have maybe traveled to Greece and presumably this is 1525 that he's doing this so presumably this is Greece under Ottoman rule and I'm wondering if anywhere in the annotations he says anything about the origins of the Turks um, their rule over Constantinople and the eastern half of the ancient Roman Empire uh, you know whether he views them as being destroyers of the civilization of antiquity or if he has uh, a different take on the Turks? Great question. Uh, he does not anywhere say any such thing. And um, yeah, so he, I, I'm not certain that he went to Greece. A few of the things he says incline me to think that he did. Um, 
and I might be willing to think that he wouldn't mention the Turks just because uh, he, his interest was really in classical antiquity. I'm not sure. It seems like that would be a difficult subject to omit if one had been to Greece. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Are any of the um, manuscripts uh, from Byzantium extant, and if so, uh, uh, where, where are they located? Any notable features of those maps? So the, the earliest surviving manuscript of Ptolemy's geography that does have maps uh, dates from about 1300, and it's in the Vatican Library. <clears throat> and it's not certain, but that may be... So the, the way Ptolemy's geography was rediscovered was that uh, a scholar, uh, Byzantine scholar, Maximus Polinudes, found a manuscript uh, of the text of Ptolemy's geography. It did not have maps, but what is Ptolemy's geography? It's instructions on how to make maps and the data to fill in those maps. So he did precisely that. Um, created a set of maps, and the Vatican manuscript from about 1300 may be that manuscript. Uh, if not, it's probably very closely related to it. But that's the earliest one that we have. Thank you. Yes. I was actually interested in the um, decorative elements in some of the annotations, the moldings, mm -hmm. and the banners. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you knew of a source for that, if you copied the banner. We saw a banner later in the book. It looked somewhat like that. Mm. But um, I'm most curious, and do you see that often? that they're framed or, I mean, it looks like moldings. Yeah, it, it does look like moldings. Uh, I have not seen that elsewhere. One of the really curious features of the book is that some of the annotations have a single border. Well, some have no border. Some have a single border. Some have a double border. And some have a triple border. I have not been able to detect any system for why those are singled out that way. And I would love to figure that out. I just had a question. I mean, in some sense, this, particularly the, the final annotator, is kind of blending genres in the sense that we have a long established tradition of chronicles, right? And, you know, Ptolemy himself is just sort of interested in making maps. So he wants to create this sort of hybrid genre. And I'm just curious if you've encountered, because it looks like we have other examples of Ptolemy that have been taking chronicle like information and putting it on a map. Do we ever find annotators of chronicles putting maps in? You know, like, do you get the reverse ever? You do sometimes. Uh, not, not by annotators that I can think of. But, you know, to have a, a, a world map in a chronicle is not unusual. I can't think of any cases offhand of an annotator to a chronicle adding a map. Um, but one of the interesting things, and just to reiterate about the, the 1525 Ptolemy, annotated is the editor had already added very extensive descriptive text to the book um, and it's interesting that someone would choose something that already had such extensive supplementary information to add even more. Yes, I, I wonder, you mentioned a lake in Urios yes. in um, Egypt and I, does, does such a lake by any name actually exist and if so What's your theory as to how this particular annotator learned about it? Uh, um, I would have to look at my notes to remember whether the lake actually exists, but I'm quite sure that that information came from the larger of the two books there. Um, and I have, I, in my notes, I have the passage. So. Yes. You mentioned that a pseudo, uh, I'm sorry. You mentioned the pseudo Aristotle several times. Yeah. What century is it supposed to be from? Uh, there's a considerable disagreement about that, but something like um, fourth to sixth century AD, I, if I recall correctly. Okay, time for one more. You mentioned that uh, the annotations in the 1525 Ptolemy were a problem approximately in 1527, yeah. right? And that was based on something that happened in Hungary a year before. Yes. Was that about the Turks uh, attacking the country? It was, yeah. 1526? Yeah, yeah. So that, that's as close as we get to a mention of the Turks, is something in Hungary rather than in Greece.
the Battle of Mohawks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, before we uh, say thank you, we do have materials out here uh, that we're willing to show you in a minute. If uh, people who can help us push the benches in, uh, and a reminder that uh, the books are out um, so that we can show them to you. Um, there are too many of you to allow you to actually page through the books, but we will be happy to try and help you get through the materials if we can. Uh, please, let's give uh, Chet another round of applause. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.